saw their teacher heal the sick, feed the hungry, walk on water, and raise the dead. A voice spoke to them from within their hearts. Pay attention to this man. He is the Holy One of God. Sometimes it can feel like these stories come from another place, another time. Our lives can feel ordinary in comparison to these giants of faith. But a voice still calls each of us to look with new eyes. This too is holy ground. Our lives are holy lives. The story of faith is still being written. You are a part of that story. God is at work in this place. God is at work in your life. Come and see what God is doing. We are standing on holy ground. We are holy people. We will be a part of God's holy mission. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who formed hills and valleys by the work of God's hand, who taught from the mountains and walked on the seas, who is with us in our highs, in our lows, and everywhere in between. Amen. Beloved, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I invite you to kneel as you are able or to remain seated. Most merciful God, you lead us to the heights, but our pride convinces us we got there on our own. You sit with us in the depths, but our despair convinces us that we are alone. You walk with us every step of our journey. But we go astray 
after our own wants and desires. And to tell us the story of your faithfulness and fail to see ourselves in the story. Forgive us, Give us your eyes to see what you are doing among us. Give us your heart to know your will for us and the world. Give us your spirit to follow what you need. Amen. Hear the good news, beloved. God who called Moses has also claimed and called you. The God who strengthened Elijah will restore your heart and your mind. God who breathes life into dry bones has defeated death. In the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Walk in faith into the future God has promised you. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're able, beloved. Let us join our hearts and voices in our gathering song, O Our Lord. person or joining us from somewhere else online. Beloved, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. A few announcements as we begin our worship today. Uh, this next week ahead of us is going to be Family Promise Week. And so I think uh, Carrie has a word for us on Family Promise. Carrie? Thank you. 
So Families Promise begins next Sunday, and I'm very happy to say that all of the um, dinners, people have volunteered to fill all the dinners for each of the seven nights we'll be hosting. There are still opportunities to um, come up and be an evening host with us. So evening hosts uh, begin, we ask everybody to come here about 5.30, and uh, we're, we wrap up by 7.30, and what we do as evening hosts is uh, prepare iced tea and lemonade, get everything ready for the guests, help serve them. Sometimes they've got lots of kids, so sometimes we um, actually cut up the kids' meat and things like that, you know, just kind of be, be helpful and be there and make them feel like they are guests of ours. It's really important, these are people facing crisis, their lives are unstable, they're you know, going through a whole lot, they're homeless and uh, temporarily being sheltered, but to have an evening meal that's cooked by us and prepared by us and served by us means a lot to them. And they're always grateful and gracious and it's a lot of fun. So if you haven't had an opportunity to participate, I'd love to talk to you after service and get you signed up and we'll make sure that if you've never done it, uh, you get signed up with other people that have so that you don't feel like you're, you know, don't know what you're doing. Um, but it is a wonderful opportunity to make a difference in the lives of people who really need it. So thank you all. Thank you, Carrie. And uh, that is not this week, but starting next Sunday, correct? A week from Sunday. A week from today. So. Uh, if you have questions about Family Promise, do let Carrie or myself know. We'd love to get you plugged in. Today, after worship, a couple opportunities for uh, Bible study will be down the hall on uh, week number two of the Holy Land trip, our Galilee portion up around the Sea of Galilee and the surrounding area. You'll hear a little bit about that in the sermon, and then an opportunity to come down the hall and hear more. And if you are in confirmation, Kelsey's probably already talked to you, but a confirmation meeting for our confirmands and their parents after worship in the youth room, in the youth room. Rally day is right around the corner and Kelsey has some words for us. Good on morning. Good morning. So rally day is not just for the youth this year because we are all continuing our education and growing in our faith. And Parish Life, we love you. They're gonna do hot dogs for lunch that day, so come hungry. And we're gonna get our lunch and every single one of us Every single one of us is going to grab our lunch and go down the hall to the big room where we're going to gather and have some fellowship. And we're going to talk about all of the learning opportunities here at Faith. And we're going to gather and we're going to hang out and we're going to, you know, enjoy each other's company. And we're going to hear about if you're an adult, if you're a youth, if you're a confirmant, if you're a high schooler, if you are interested in what, a, what they do at Ladies Bible Study on Thursday, if you're interested in quilting, if you're interested in our women's group that we're starting up. All of the opportunities that we have, and we're gonna hear about that. We're gonna have an opportunity to hear more about what godly play is. We're gonna have an opportunity to hear more about what they're doing in confirmation. We're gonna get a glimpse at the narrative lectionary. It's gonna be an overall package of what's happening here at St. Martin's. So you don't wanna miss it, and you wanna bring friends. Because not only is it free hot dogs, which, woo, because we love food, it's an opportunity for them to see what we do, and it's an opportunity for them to get plugged in, and an opportunity for them to see that we do so many awesome and wonderful things, not just on Sunday mornings, but throughout the whole week. So this is a great opportunity to grab your neighbor, grab your brother-in-law, grab your friend from the hair salon, and bring them to church on Sunday for food, fellowship, and fun. So we will see you on the 10th. It'll be super fun. Thank you, Kelsey. So two weeks from today, September 10th, Rally Day. And in addition, choir will be kicking off that day. Renee, you've got a word for us? Just a quick word. Yes, choir will be commencing again um, that same Sunday. And we rehearse at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning. So a little early for those early birds. And if you aren't,
do or nay. So if you are interested in singing in the choir, get up a little early, grab your coffee, and come make a joyful noise starting on September 10th. Finally, beloved, as we enter into worship today, a bit of news in the body of Christ. Many of you have already heard our brother Tony Martinez died on Friday. Uh, Tony had been ill and uh, took a, a rather sudden turn for the worse. Um, and so he has uh, died. Tony was our music director here at St. Martin's for many years, very dear to many of us. Uh, in more recent years, he was the music director at House of Prayer Lutheran, and he is the husband of Pastor Marvin Havard, uh, who is serving at Faith. And so uh, I ask your prayers for Pastor Marvin, uh, for all those who love Tony, who grieve Tony. And I remind you again, we are a resurrection people. And that though Tony has died, the promise of Christ is that today, Tony lives. And he is with our Savior, and we will see our brother again. I, I wish you peace in that knowledge, and I invite your prayers for resurrection peace for all who are grieving Tony's death. Now, beloved, I invite you to rise as your let us continue to make a joyful noise of worship to our Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Good morning, friends. Good morning. Hey, so I've been thinking about Pastor Will's Hills and Valley sermon, and I thought of a camp song. You ready? I think of a lot of camp songs. That's where my like ministry started. It's a one that it comes from the book of Psalms. And I'm not going to sing it because make a joyful noise is not my thing. But it goes like this. It goes, to you, O Lord, we lift up our souls. To you, we trust, O Lord. Amen? Let me repeat that. And then it goes, higher than the mountains, deeper than the seas. Oh, I see some of you know the motions. Deeper than the seas, wider than the ocean is your love for me. You're with me on the mountains and the valleys below. You are right here beside me everywhere that I go. And I've been thinking about that a lot because we're talking about mountains and valleys. And I found it really interesting that we say you are you know, higher than the mountains, deeper than the seas, wider than the ocean. It's your love for me. Do you guys know this one? I know a lot of kids will lose their hell this one. You're with me on the mountains and the valleys below. And then it goes directly into the you are right here beside me. And then we go everywhere that I go. I think it's interesting because it goes from valleys to telling us that God is with us where we go. Does that mean that God is with us in the valley? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Do you think God is with us on the mountaintops too? Yeah. yeah. So God is with us in the dark times, and God is with us when we're on the mountaintop. And Pastor Will is talking this week about when he goes to Galilee. And Galilee is a really important part when we're talking about the story of Jesus. Lots of of crazy things happen in Jesus' ministry in Galilee. It's kind of like a home base for Jesus. Lots of things happen, and what you hear about that when you look at the, all of the Gospels. But God was there in all of the crazy things that happen, in all of the everyday things that happen in Galilee, in all of the things, because God is right there beside us everywhere that we go. Yeah? Let's pray. Dear God, Dear God, thank you that you're with us on the mountains and the valleys below, and you are right there beside us everywhere that we go. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. The sermon text today comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 18, verses 20 through 40. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah then came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I even I only am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets number 450. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire is indeed God. All the people answered, well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many, then call on the name of your God, but put no fire to it. So they took the bull that was given to them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal, from morning until noon, crying, O oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no answer. They lived about the, offer that, about the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, surely he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he has wandered away, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Then they cried aloud, and as was their custom, they cut themselves with swords and lances until the blood gushed out, all, all, out over them. As midday passed, 
They raved on until the time of the offering of oblation, but there was no voice, no answer, and no response. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come closer to me. And all the people came closer to him. First he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. With these stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar, large enough to contain two measures of seed. Next he put the wood in order. He cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. He, he, he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. Again he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So that the water ran around the altar and filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of oblation, the prophet Elijah came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known that this day you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, that I have done these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned and that you have turned their back, hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and even kicked, uh, licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord indeed is God. The Lord indeed is God. Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. They seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the Wadi Kaishan and killed them there. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. <laughs> According to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Beloved, let us read together our gospel reflection. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, the son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I invite you to be seated, beloved. Grace and peace be to you from God our Creator and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, dear friends in Christ, as we continue our journey through the hills and valleys of the Holy Land, we pick up right where we left off last week, crossing 
from Jordan into the Promised Land. Now, those of you who came down the hall heard our presentation last week may remember we talked about that border crossing from Jordan into Israel. If you weren't there, let me tell you, it was a bit of a multi-step ordeal. Soldiers looked under the bus as we pulled up to the checkpoint in Jordan. We had to take all our bags off so they could be inspected, then reload them on the bus, drive a little bit further so we could go have our passport stamped, our visa issued. Then we unloaded the bus again so that we could go over the border into Israel. We have said goodbye to our Jordanian bus driver and tour guide who would not be permitted to cross with us. We'd be meeting a new guide and a new driver on the Israeli side. And as we entered the building there, then we had our luggage inspected again, and we were asked a series of questions. Now we've been told ahead of time to expect these questions and how we ought answer to make things go smoothly. We are part of a Christian tour group on a pilgrimage to holy sites. There are 40 of us traveling together. No one has been given anything to take across the border. No one has given us anything. We plan to be in the country this many days. We're going to these specific places. And those of us who answered our questions satisfactorily were sent to lines A and B, which were much like you'd see in airport security. <coughs> those who did not were sent to line C, which was back a hallway a little more private where there could be some additional screenings. And then of course, once our bags were cleared, there were more questions and our passports were examined. They let Julie right into the country. Apparently I am more suspicious. I got to answer lots of questions. Questions are a big part of our lives, aren't they? We deal with a lot of them on a daily basis, especially those of us with children of a certain age. Yesterday we were watching one of the Harry Potter movies and Ryan was asking lots of questions about the plot of a movie she has seen numerous times. She's also fond of asking us would you rather questions and giving us personality quizzes from her magazines. While those questions may not have terribly far-reaching ramifications, other questions can be life-changing. For instance, a couple Christmases ago, I asked Julie a question that changed both our lives. Will you marry me? She answered me with another question. Are you sure? <laughs> I was, and still am. Today, our journey brings us to the hills and valleys of the Galilee region, where two questions of great importance were asked. The first question was asked of um, the top of Mount Carmel. The prophet Elijah had confronted the wicked King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, pronouncing a drought on the whole land as punishment for them leading the people astray. For three and a half years, no rain fell in Israel. But Elijah was sustained, first being fed by ravens at a wadi, and then by a widow whose jars of oil and meal never ran dry. But eventually, Elijah had to return to Israel. So he called Ahab and his false prophets to come to Mount Carmel for a final showdown between the Lord and Baal. As the people gathered, he asked them, how long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. As Johnny Cash would tell you, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. So who will you serve? But the people don't answer. So the contest is held. Two bowls are prepared for burnt offering, but the priests are not to set fire. Whoever's God responds by sending fire from heaven will be the winner. And from the look of things, the prophets of Baal have absolutely every advantage in this matchup. For starters, it's being held on Mount Carmel, which is Baal's territory. He has home field advantage. For another thing, there are 450 prophets of Baal, while Elijah stands alone on the Lord's side. 
And Elijah even lets them go first. The prophets of Baal select the better of the bulls. They prepare it and choose just the right time. This should be an easy win. Baal does not respond. The prophets pray and cry out to Baal. Some of them even begin to offer their own blood as incentive for Baal to respond, but there is nothing. And Elijah goads them, cry aloud, surely he's a god. Either he is meditating or he has wandered away or he's on a journey or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. The English makes that sound far more polite than it is. Essentially, what Elijah is saying is, well, maybe Baal is a little bit confused, or perhaps he's going to relieve himself behind a bush. Just cry louder. And then it's Elijah's turn. But before he prays, he repairs the altar, and then he digs a trench. He sends people to fetch four jars of water and pour them on the sacrifice, then sends them a second and a third time. Soon the offering and the wood and the altar are soaked and the trench is filled with water. And then Elijah prays, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Fire comes down from heaven, consuming the bowl, the wood, the stones, the dust, and even the water in the trench. When the people see it, they declare that the Lord alone is God, and Elijah orders that the 450 prophets of Baal be put to death. Who will you serve? Some Christian traditions really emphasize that choice. We talk about believers' baptism and inviting Jesus into our hearts. There's even a hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. It doesn't get sung in a lot of Lutheran churches. And I don't want to make light of the power of that choice, dear church, but if we are really honest with ourselves, the truth is that we are asked that question not once, but many times over the course of our lives. Who will you serve? We answer the question every day by our actions and our attitudes. Martin Luther famously said that wherever we put our trust, that ultimately is our God. So when we put our trust in money to fix every problem, then money is our God. When we put our trust in a leader, be they president, parliament, or pastor, then that leader becomes an idol. When our choices show that we'd rather go our own way than follow where God is leading, we have shown by our actions who we really have decided to serve. Who will you serve? The question is answered often in Scripture. Moses says, choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Elijah says, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant. I will tell you, beloved, that not a single one of them answered that question only once. They had to affirm it and reaffirm it every day. They had to choose again and again to follow the Lord, they had to figure out what it means to choose the Lord as their God. And that is the second question of great importance that we hear today. Not from the mountaintop at Carmel, but from somewhere near a cave in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus and his disciples had traveled quite a bit north to get there. When they came to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked them the question, Who do people say that I am? The disciples tell him, Some folks say you're John the Baptist. Some folks say you're Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then Jesus gets to the point, Who do you say that I am? Peter makes a bold confession, You are the Messiah, the Son 
of the living God. Jesus confirms this. Tells Peter that he is the rock on which Jesus will build his church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against him. Now church, this is an important conversation, but it seems at first glance that it really could have happened anywhere. Especially when you realize just how far a walk it must have been to get from Capernaum to Caesarea Philippi. If Jesus was just curious What's the scuttlebutt about me? Couldn't he have just asked in Capernaum or Magdala or Nazareth? But it's not by happenstance that Jesus has this conversation in this place. Caesarea Philippi was also known as Banias, or in Greek, Panias, the Greek god Pan. Prior to the Hellenistic period, the place had been the site of the worship of several other idols and gods. In this place were alcoves dedicated to the worship of multiple deities. Among them was a cave from which a spring gushed forth. That cave was thought to be an entrance into the underworld and was known as the Gates of Hades. Jesus chose this place specifically in sight of all of the empty choices and dead ends and roads to hell, to ask his disciples a question of deep importance. Who do you say that I am? Dear church, that question is being put to us today and every day. There are a whole lot of opinions out there about what it means be a Christian. There are a whole lot of thoughts about who exactly God is, and a lot of them are not flattering. Back in 2007, Gabe Lyons and David Kinnaman published a book called Unchristian, exploring research done into the perceptions of young non-Christians about Christianity and the church. The findings were not positive. Hypocritical, sheltered, judgmental, anti-LGBTQ, and so on. And I can promise you, friends, the last 16 years have not done much to change people's minds for the better. And in a world that starts with the base assumption that the church is out to build a kingdom for itself in our own image, no matter who gets hurt along the way, there is a desperate need for those who have said, we will serve the Lord, to also be clear about what that means. Who do you say that Jesus is? If we cannot answer that question, if we are not curious about finding an answer to that question, then friends, we may be spending our Sunday mornings in the wrong place. This world does not need more country club Christians. It needs disciples who have chosen to follow Jesus because they know exactly who he is. The Messiah, the son of the living God. The one who loved this beautiful broken world enough to die for it and whose love was stronger than the grave. The one who healed the sick who drove out demons, who sought the lost, who remembered the outcast, who forgave the sinner, who washed the feet of doubters and deniers and deserters and destroyers, the one who called us to do likewise, and who showed us how to love a broken world back into wholeness and hope. Your church, who will you as we gather in this place this morning and every time we come together it is imperative that we remember that this is not my church or your church this mission and this ministry in this place does not belong to any person or committee or group or leader or pastor this is God's church it is the body of Christ and we are members of it when we gather here, we are saying that we have chosen to walk the way of the cross and be servants of the servant, disciples of Jesus Christ. We 
which necessarily begs the question, who do you say that he is? How will you tell the world of the hope you have found? How will you show the world the love that has found you? How we answer these questions has great importance. It can change the world, but it can only do so if it first changes us. Who will you serve? Who do you say that he is? Make no mistake, beloved, people are asking. They may not use those words, but the eyes of our friends, our neighbors, our children, our community are on us. But when you are asked, dear church, how will you answer? Amen. Amen. But your rise, you're able, let us join our hearts and voices in our hymn of the day. A mighty fortress is our God. <laughs>
us confess just who it is we say we serve, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to be seated or to kneel for the prayers. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. God, God of pilgrims and prophets, inspire your church to pursue righteousness in its ministry. Equip us to share your compassion that unites us as one family of faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Remind us that from the beginning of creation, you knit together a world meant for harmony. Protect and restore the wasted places to joy and gladness. Be with all those recovering from fire and flood, heat and hurricane. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy is great. Stir the leaders of nations and towns, militaries and courts to respond to your teachings. Let your call for justice reach all people and bring deliverance where there is oppression. Pray especially for Israel and Palestine. Oh, hear us, O oh God. Show us your steadfast love and faithfulness to those in despair. Increase their strength. Care for all who feel low. Keep safe any in the midst of trouble and protect vulnerable people from harm, especially all those whose names are on our prayer list and all those we name before you now, aloud or in silence of our hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Encourage those who offer their gifts and talents in service to your church. Energize this congregation's rostered and lay leaders, musicians and teachers and greeters, and administrators so they may be transformed in sharing your grace. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of all the saints, death is overcome in Christ's resurrection. We rejoice with the faithful departed. Sustain us in hope until we come at last at our last heavenly home. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Beloved, let us share that peace with one another.
God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. And us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It is right. It is it is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, poured out for you and for all people, forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of travel, and deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Loving, no matter who you are, what you've done, or what has been done to you, there is grace for that. Come to the table. Taste and see that the Lord is good. We invite you to be seated. Our ushers will invite you forward by rope.
may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace unto life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world, to the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 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 Well, I invite you to rise as you're able for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Lord, let us join our hearts and voices for our ascending song, Faith of Our Fathers. 